Welcome to the 64th episode of the interview series. The interview series is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa-based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our website, oneweekcritique.com. And please like and subscribe to help us continue producing valuable content. I'm Matthew Schmidt, joined today by Todd Osborne. Todd Osborne Hello. is a poet and teacher originally from Nashville. <laughs> he is a feedback editor for Tinderbox Poetry Journal and a poetry reader for Morris. His poems have been featured at Scrawl Place, Cut Bank, The Missouri Review, Tar River Poetry, and Eco Theo Review. He lives in Hattiesburg, Mississippi with his wife and their three cats. Welcome, Todd. Hello. I jumped the gun on the hello. That's all right. Everyone's excited, excited to be here, you know? Yeah, that's right. So today we're going to be looking at a history of gardening from Gatherer, uh, which came out this year on yep. Ballpoint Press. It did, yes. So the early draft is called On Gardening, and there's a note. It's noted as a sonetto e mezzo, or sonnet and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, what is that form? And how does it operate in the poem? It's not like uh, your usual form. No, it's, I, I don't know what made me come up with it. I think it was just maybe the, the insanity of like our last semester in, in a PhD program. And I was like, oh, I, I, I have a, I have a deep love of sonnets. It was like part of my dissertation. Um, so like, you know, that's always something that's been really interesting to me. And I, I'm interested in form. I love, especially like newer forms, you know, things like the Pachak Cha by Terrence Hayes, things that are like uh, sort of taking these traditional forms and doing something new with them. And I thought, well, is there something you can, like, what have we not done with a sonnet? And I love sonnets. I love the like brevity of them. And I just thought, what if you gave them a little more room to breathe? And so I came up with this 21 line form that I honestly have not uh, returned to. I wrote this one and I wrote like another one that pairs with it. And I almost see them as like they are a, a distinct form unto themselves. And I don't know if I could repeat it. But to talk briefly about it, it is this sort of um, like sonnet like form where you have, you know, voltas at the appropriate moments um you have like moments where the the poem sort of turns or you know does something else um and i was paying really close attention to have not in the first octave but in the second half of the poem basically to to have like some attention to the way that the the lines are ending and in fact if you look in the actual collection the two Maybe I'm wrong about this. I wrote the poems and I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure what I did is the last stanza of each poem have like the same end of words. So you have like these words that sort of recur. And um, yeah, I I just sort of thought like, if you let a sonnet breathe, how does that change it, right? Sonnets are like these small, you know, like they're like rooms, right? Like tiny little chambers. Um, and so, like, what happens if you, like, let in a little more light, a little more air? What does that do to the form? Well, and if I remember correctly, the end of the first sonnet and a half is begins the second sonnet and a half, yeah. which is like a sonnet crown, only right. without all the points on the crown, so to speak. Yeah. It's a um, very, uh, very cheap crown. <laughs> Indeed. Uh yeah, so why not go for the whole crown? Oh, I mean, I think you know the answer to that. I uh, it's hard. Yes, it's, it's really hard. hard to do. Um, I think I have tried to write a sonnet crown like maybe once or twice. I wrote one that was like a sonnet crown where each successive sonnet was like one line less or something like that, and that was really challenging. Um, look, I uh. I am many things, but if you give me an option between being done with something or working harder to continue, 
I'm probably going to pick being done if I can help it. Um, I think that's one of the things that I really appreciated about being in a, like a graduate program or being in a, a situation where there's other people keeping you accountable is they'll say, no, you can't stop here. Right. You have to keep going. Um, yeah. But I think uh, for me that the sequence felt done after two, like, I think uh, if I had kept going, I probably could have gotten a whole crown, but I think it would have had diminishing returns. And I wanted, I really liked, uh, because in the book, it basically appears as like two poems, one on each page. And so you have this like, oh, interesting. And they have the same title, right? Um, and so I, I appreciate that you can just have this like, this distinct, discrete, like they, both of the poems were published individually. They weren't published with each other. And so they're, they are their own discrete thing. But then when they are next to each other, they sort of speak back to each other in an interesting way. Yeah. Well, let's get some words in the air uh, from yeah. this early draft. Uh, okay. I will share the screen so our readers can take a look at it while you read it to us. Cool. Perfect. And whenever you're ready, sir. All right. On gardening, Soneto y Mezzo. I would like a garden to call out to once a week after dark, just to say, how are you? No response required, but if the flowers crook, at the neck, if the bushes stop rustling to listen, I will take that as answer. I will take my time bending into their ears, whispering sweet somethings, tucking them into bed, patting their heads with water from a metal can. I guess some people can do a lot with a small plot, but I'm useless even in an expanse. Both of my grandfathers have gardens, roses, zucchini, okra, Utility and beauty mingled together. Even after death, they continue. They give back some of what they have received. I can throw my hands into dirt. I can do what I must. Let the sun do the rest. Excellent. Thank you. So the final draft, which we'll get to shortly, actually begins and ends with the grandfathers. Yeah. Why do you think this edit is so important to the poem? Well, because I think ultimately, like, that's what I wanted the poems to be about, right? It's like using the gardening to talk more about, like, a family history or a family legacy. And so in my mind, that's like the interesting moment, right? The interesting moment is not necessarily like the speaker thinking about what they would, what they want to do or what would be interesting to them. I think if you immediately start with the grandfathers, it like grounds the poems it gives it more of a, like a depth immediately, right? Because I think a lot of people, uh, like, I don't know that if I read this, I would be like, yeah, I want a garden. I, I wouldn't necessarily relate to that, but I can relate to like, oh yeah, I have a grandfather who, you know, did some activity that feels foreign or like unusual to me. Um, especially when you think about like, I'm thinking about for me personally, my, my grandfather was like, uh, well, now I'm going to, mess up my grandfather's biography but i i want to say like uh a veteran of like the marines or the navy or something right like uh, this like very solid sort of stoic guy but he had a rose garden that or like a rose you know uh bush that he was very proud of that he like took care of um and so like what does that say about our traditional ideas of you know what it what what it means to like garden or to care for things or to cultivate something um yeah and so that answer yeah uh so the speaker we can say the speaker is you in this poem yeah i think that's fine uh, <laughs> i sort of i sort of showed my hand a little bit yes yes um so why why is gardening foreign to you like in this situation to this yeah. speaker? oh man i mean it's so funny i would always like my mom would joke about having like a numb thumb uh, or like whatever the opposite of a green thumb is, right? Like just if my mom puts something in the ground, it's going to die. And uh, <laughs> similarly, like I just never, uh, I never really tried. I like, I don't think it's that I couldn't do it. I think it's that I didn't put my energy into it. And so uh, that idea of like 
feeling such a connection to the earth that you want to plant something into it that you can then grow and either admire or use um you know totally foreign the uh the okra and zucchini is actually my my other technically step grandpa but we'll say grandpa because it's cleaner my other grandpa who like had this beautiful mountain home that he had like i think partially constructed himself or at least had built and so it's like these two pictures of like what it means to uh like grow up in the world and and do things that to me felt totally foreign like i just you know couldn't imagine constructing a house or uh you know growing okra or zucchini or zucchini or something like that well you do grow poems as it were uh that is that's that is true perhaps your type of gardening well, and like, isn't that like such a poem thing? Like Seamus Heaney being like, oh yeah, I can't actually dig, but I'm going to dig. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is something I think poets have been constantly wrestling with. Like, oh, well, my, my forebears really worked with their hands and I'm sitting in a desk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, let's talk about some of your, uh, your uh, uh, seeds here. Um, yeah, please. So the diction in the poem, I think, is pretty carefully chosen. Mm. Uh, there is subtle rhyme. There's overt rhyme. Um, and there's also hints of words or sounds that have different meanings. Uh, so like bend turns into bed. Uh, can turns into ken. And I really like the rhyme of stems from the first stanza that lands on remains in the final stanza. Mm. So what would you say the overriding first principle is? Is it form or is it sound? I think for me, uh, I think it's hard to to extricate the two, right? Like, I think if you are writing in a form, then you have to be thinking about why, why am I doing that? And what are the sounds that will help me do that? I love you, you pointing out the way that like words transform into other words. It's one of my favorite things that poets do in general. And so... Uh, you know, of course, I'm going to steal that as well. Like, it's just such a, a such a cool thing. Um, and I think as far as like, the way that I first approached poetry was almost like mathematical, right? Like, I would be sitting there reading, like, T.S. Eliot or Auden. Uh, I think I remember, like, I had a big book of like, uh, not a big book, but I had like a collected or a selected Auden. And he was like, so good at slant rhyme and like these half rhymes like him and dylan thomas and i would read those and just be like wow this is so cool like it doesn't rhyme but it does rhyme and that to me was so interesting and so you know i think it's it's uh in some ways kind of unfortunate that like that kind of poetry that poetic style is no longer in fashion not that like look there's a lot of that kind of poetry that <laughs> should not be in fashion but there's something like so beautiful about a, a rhyme that arrives right when it's supposed to that like hits you and makes you stop and go oh wow that's like a really great rhyme so like if I can use internal rhyme or I can use that sort of half rhyme I will I don't, I don't do it as much as I probably did in this poem but certainly for like I think writing these poems I felt if I'm gonna like make the bold claim of like, this is a sonnet and a half, this is a sonetto e mezzo, which is like somehow even more ridiculous to put it <laughs> into like Italian. Uh, which I think was truly just me going to Google Translate and, and writing sonnet and a half. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then seeing and then seeing what Google told me. Um, but like, if I'm going to do that, then I got to take it seriously, right? Like the people who were originally writing sonnets, like, they were doing it because they uh, they felt like they had to express themselves. Or maybe, I, I mean, I don't know this. I'm projecting a lot onto 14th century Italian lawyers. But I can't imagine that you're like, oh, well, I just worked a long day. And, you know, or maybe I didn't work a long day because I'm a nobleman. But I'm going to just sit down and write a sonnet. Like, no, I think they put a lot of, like, work and effort into it. And so it felt like I had to honor that if I was going to try and, like, extend the lineage of the sonnet. Yeah, no, I, I think there's, you make a good point about the rhyme arriving on time, uh, mm. because 
you know, often we think sometimes of the poem as a contract with the reader uh, in, insofar as like, if you're going to set up an expectation, you have to meet that expectation or somehow change the expectation so much in the poem that it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and the, the one thing that is interesting about slant rhyme is, you know, it meets the expectation, but it doesn't, it changes the expectation. And so that actually right. gets you more as opposed to less, um, mm -hmm. because then it operates like it, it makes the reader use their mind and be like, Oh, so this is where that echo is coming from. And this right. is why it's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's also why you see like, there's not a, you know, this isn't like an Italian sonnet and a half or an English sonnet and a half. It is its own sort of strange beast, I guess you could say. Um, where like, you know, I I don't know that I could sit down and like if I was teaching this to like my my students in in like AP Lit and be like, okay, guys, this is a an A B A B. It's like you sort of have to really squint and be like, does call from the first line rhyme with small? It does, but like, are we are we taking uh, you know that big of a gap between rhymes? Maybe, and I and I think that's yeah. I liked uh, I think when I was reading poetry, I liked working to try and understand what the poet was doing. That was like really fun for me, and so I think I like the idea of like rewarding those readers that are going to really take time with the poem. Yeah, well, and it's also you know to go back to our uh, common metaphor of gardening here. Uh, Right, you plant something in the ground, you're expecting a certain plant to come up instead of another plant, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, can you defy all of those expe ex expectations and think something else is going to come, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think like, if you say, hey, you're walking into a sonnet, you expect it to be a sonnet. Um, you know, even if it's like a slightly different sonnet or I'm thinking of like, uh, you know, Terrence Hayes' American Sonnets, like, or Wanda Coleman's American Sonnets, those are clearly to me sonnets, like, not just because they announce themselves as sonnets, but they are, like, interested in interrogating what a sonnet looks like, you know, in a in a totally different and distinct context from when it was originally imagined. Um, and I think the interesting, the interesting thing about, you know, that project is, like, oh, I can see the way that those poems are sonnets even if they don't look the way that like, you know, a, a Philip Sidney sonnet would look or a, a Shakespearean sonnet or something like that. Right. Well, and some of that is, you know, would a Philip Sidney poem, you know, interest as wide of a group of people now as it, as it did in the time. Right. It out. It's just, you know, taste change things. Yeah. Culture changes. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a necessary step probably in order yeah. for uh, there to be enough readers for the poem mm -hmm. as you know for public consumption i guess you could say oh yeah totally all right well let's look at the final draft here and i'll ask you to read that perfect okay mm -hmm. okay a history of garden both of my grandfathers have gardens, roses, zucchini, okra, beauty and utility. I would like a garden to call out to once a week after dark. How are you? If the flowers crook their stems, if the bushes stop rustling, I will take that as answer. Keep watch over them as a trellis. I will take my time, bend into their ears, Whisper sweet somethings, tuck them in, pat their beds with water from a metal can. Even after death, my grandfather's work continues. The gardens return what they have received. Some people can do a lot with a small plot, but I am useless even in an expanse. The ground is patient. It will do what it can, but first, action is required. Rain may fall, may wash the ground or flood us all away. I could wither, could decide not to stay. My grandfathers have gardens. I will have what remains. So, 
personally, I think the crucial edit is inserting the last line of the octave. Uh, mm. Keep watch over them as a trellis. Uh, yeah. Because I think it strengthens the octave and, and sets up the sestet and septet that are to follow. Um, and I think it's not simply a watching, but a weaving of the grandfathers and grandson. Uh, mm -hmm. And it more obviously speaks to form and what form can do in poetry and the natural world. Yeah. So is this why you use form so often in Gatherer? Or are there other factors that guide your usage? Mm. I want to just say, I do think like this is a formally stronger version of the poem, right? Like I think even looking back at the first draft, like, yeah, it's called a sonetto e mezzo. It's not really doing as much with the distinct octave sestet septet as it probably could have. And so I do think like, that's one of the great things about revision is you get to figure out, oh, what am I actually trying to do or trying to say? And how can I best do that? And I think you, I, I love that you point out the keep watch over them as a trellis, because I think, uh, you know, when you're in a poem, you're not thinking as much about like, well, what am I, or at least I, I'm not thinking as much about like, what am I uh, ultimately, you know, trying to do? You sort of like get that after you have have gotten it out of your system and then you go back and say, okay, what, what was happening? And so, yeah, I do think that line's crucial. It's something about like, it's not just that the the speaker wants gardens for their own sake, right? Like he wants them to be able to connect with the grandfathers in some way and, and maybe a way that he feels like he can't currently. Um, yeah. Um, why do I keep coming back to form? I mean, part of it's I love form. I think it's so fun. I think this, like, there is this, like, uh, idea that I am not the first to say this, but I think when you are bound into something, it, like, frees you up in a lot of ways. If you tell me, oh, hey, you're writing a Sestina, you got to keep using these same words. For me, it becomes a fun game of, like, how can I reuse these words in a way that doesn't deaden them? in a way that keeps the words interesting. And it could be that, you know, I might subtly change the word, right? Maybe each time it's like a slight variation on the word. Or one of my favorite things when I'm writing a sestina is to like have a really short last line of a stanza. So you get back to the repeated word even quicker, which I think is like kind of counterintuitive. You'd think like, oh, you want to make those lines really long. No, I think a sestina with short lines, more fun because then you're really saying, hey, you got to deal with these words. And if you don't like it, get out of here. <laughs> um, so part of it is like, I think form is fun. I think it's really fun. Now, caveat, I don't, uh, I don't often write like metrical form because once again, if the option is let me have some fun or let me really work at it, <laughs> I'm going to opt for fun every time uh, or ease, um, which is, which is a character flaw of mine. But um, you know, I think there's just so much, like, the sonnet exists, like, it's already out there, and if you want to, if you want to never write a sonnet, I think that's totally fine, like, I'm sure there are a lot of poets that say, I don't want to ever deal with form, I'm doing my own thing, but, like, how many times can you write a poem that was written in the same way that, like, Shakespeare wrote a poem, or that John Donne, or you know, John Keats, or uh, someone that's not an old dead white guy named John. <laughs> like, there's there's so many fun things you can do with those forms. You can say like, oh, hey, I'm actually going to take this form that has this canonical, uh, you know, like way that it's being used and I'm going to break it or I'm going to reinterpret it for a different audience or, you know, to go back to like Wanda Coleman and Terrence Hayes. I Like, they're using the sonnet because of the history of it, right? And saying, oh, hey, this was a, the, the form that was used mostly by like rich white guys and I'm going to put it into a totally different context and see what it can do and it can do a lot like it's it's such an interesting thing and I for me and obviously like I I struggle writing like prose a lot like you know creative prose sometimes um I think once again uh just cuz I I would rather I want it to, I want to see the, the results a lot quicker than you get to with prose. 
uh-huh. um, and like have something to revise. I don't want to have to write for like years and then start revising. That seems daunting. Uh, and I'm sure the prose writers in the world are like, yeah, it is. Well, <laughs> have you tried poetry? Yeah. Um, but like, uh, man, there's something about like being able to use this this form and use it to your own to your own ends to to do something that is like interesting to you right like i don't know i think i maybe just rambled about forms for for half a minute but that's that's what i got yeah well i mean so you mentioned games and having fun and yeah right part of part of the idea of any game is that there are parameters which in with the game is played right and you know it's always how do i use the parameters to win the game or or do something interesting with the game yep. maybe i'm maybe i'm trying to throw the game um mm-hmm. you know maybe i'm trying to win in a different way or by technicality or 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 what have you um, Te- technically a sonnet yeah it's technically a sonnet <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But, but so here, here's an interesting question I think that I was thinking of while you were talking is that we have both mentioned, you know, breaking the form. Uh, yeah. And so in a way that is going against the parameters, right? So like, yeah. so the question is how, how far can you go when you, when you break the parameters of the mm-hmm. form? Yeah. I that's such an interesting question I was thinking about there's a poem in the collection that's a it's called epithalamium for pandemic wedding and it was I wrote it for for me and my wife we got married in June 2020 um and it started out as a sonnet like I wrote it as a sonnet and if you look in the collection like it's got an octave assessed it and then it keeps going for like another page and a half because I was like oh I actually can't say everything I want to say about this experience in just 14 lines like it's a nice idea like oh well I love sonnet a wedding sonnet oh that's so great no couldn't do it so I just said okay well uh screw it we're maybe we're technically a sonnet but we're gonna keep going right yeah so uh yeah I think like at what point if you stop doing the things like if you do a sestina where the words are changing every stanza is it still a sestina? Like, okay, so you've got 39 lines here, but like, what, or 42, yeah, 39, 42, 39, 39 okay. I was like, how big is the envoy? It's, yeah, it's three. 30, okay. it's three lines, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, like, what happens, uh, what happens if you write a sonnet that's like 13 lines or 15 lines or, uh, what is that? John Hollander has a book of like, is it 17 line sonnets or something crazy yeah. like that? So it's like, what are we doing at that point? Are we still, what is the benefit of calling it a sonnet? Um, and I think the benefit of it is that you get to say like, no, I'm still in, I'm still in a uh, conversation with all these other, you know, sonneteers that have come before. And what I'm saying is actually we, we can sort of be more expansive in our definition. Like, I don't think, you know, going back to this idea of, like, a game, I think, like, for me, yes, games have rules, but, like, isn't it more fun when you're playing, like, your own version of Monopoly that doesn't go by the strict, like, Milton Bradley rules they've laid out? It's like, no, when I when I land on, you know, uh, free parking, I want all the money that we have put in the middle or whatever, you know, whatever it is, whatever yeah. your house rule is. Um, and so I think, like... Yeah, in some ways, the the fun is in how can you bend it or even break it and still have it be recognizably the thing that, that it is. Right. And and this poem uh, is also like it reminds me of like it's an elegy. Uh, it's a lament. Um, mm-hmm. Right. There's a lot of yearning in this particular poem. So another question is like how many different forms can you put into a single poem? Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think when I when I wrote this, my my grandfather who uh, had roses had already passed, um, and so in a lot of ways, it is like, oh, I'm never going to be able to connect with him again. 
right? But if I wanted to, I could go back to the house, presumably, that he lived in with my grandmother and look at the roses, right? Like, assuming the current owner hasn't, like, dug them up and <laughs> burned them or something. <laughs> but, like, there is this, there's something sort of beautiful about the fact that, like, you know, if if you plant, you know, a rose or, like, a tree or something, you can go back and look at it later, and it's going to keep going because it doesn't actually require humans to maintain it right i think a lot of times as humans we think like oh well we are we are very um necessary for the continuance of the world and it's like well i don't know the world did pretty good without us and it's gonna do well without us again probably um it'll probably do better without us at this point uh but <laughs> not to bring us way way out field <laughs> but um yeah i think the, the thing that I've always appreciated about poetry is that it seems like it can hold like almost a limitless amount of things, right? Like you can have an elegy that is also like a celebration that is also, yeah, a lament or, you know, like now I'm thinking, could you have an elegy that is also kind of a love poem? And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. There's a poem in the collection about, and this is so left field, Henry Cavill's character in Mission Impossible Fallout. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it is at once like sort of an elegy for my grandmother, uh, sort of a poem about like love and the people that love you and how they like keep you close. And also a, like a poem about like one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen, which is this like giant man punching the air as if he has to get his fist ready to, to like start a fight, as if he's cocking his fist. Um, and it's got all of that in it, and it's also like ten lines or something. It's it's like one of the shorter poems in the collection, and like that's absurd. That's just like patently absurd. If I told you like, oh hey, there's this poem about Henry Cavill that's also about you know me finding out my grandmother died, uh, you would just say like, well no that doesn't make sense. But at the same time, you know it reminds me of the Clay Aiken's poem, which to me is like such a silly and absurd poem and then ends on like I think a very sad or sort of uh melancholy image of like Clay Aiken patting his son on the head and going to bed alone or going maybe going to bed with another Clay Aiken anyway yeah you know yeah. it's interesting when uh one of my grandfathers died uh Mission Impossible 2 had just come out and we, the cousins, went to Mission Impossible 2 because after a while, the wake was, you know, a little much. Yeah. Uh, so we went and we watched the whole movie, which is probably like two and a half hours or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. It's like an, yeah. It's an absurd amount of time. <laughs> I don't remember anything about the film. I remember nothing whatsoever about that film. And I've never, I've never gone back and watched it because I'm like, what good would that do? I don't right. know. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange thing. It is. No, 100%. I like went to a fugue state and I like imprinted upon the entire franchise. Like, yeah, I don't. There's like so much about. It's why I think like when people are like, oh, you know, movies don't matter. TV shows don't matter. I'm like, well, no, I think they're important because they like give us something to uh, like connect with and talk about. And like, that's also why I think literature is important because it's like this thing that can connect people um you know like i don't know what my life would be like if i hadn't been reading books from a young age or hadn't been watching tv or playing video games like it would certainly be less um yeah that's wow yeah i think you're good mission impossible 2 it is wild but you're okay to not rewatch it <laughs> well i've watched most of them anyway so like you know yeah. I think I'm covered in the general sense of what happens. Yeah. Uh, Tom Cruise runs a lot. Yes, he does. He does more and more death-defying stunts. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, all right. <laughs> to get back to the poem. <laughs> no, no, no. Let's stay on Mission Impossible. This is now a Mission Impossible interview. Uh, so the speaker wants to call to the gardens after dark. Yeah. What does the darkness allow that the daylight forsakes? Oh man, doesn't doesn't it feel like sometimes the darkness allows for like more intimacy? Like it's like no one's looking, 
at when it's at after dark um there is this sort of like and in, and I almost like every time I read this poem I have an image of like me like peeking my head out of a door you know right after sunset and being like how are you how's it going guarding like every time I read it I I have I like affect the sort of like sing-songy tone on that line because it just feels right it feels like well if you were gonna talk to your garden you wouldn't just be like hello garden how are you today you would have like a, a certain way that you would talk to it and so I think the darkness you know I think uh it just allows for like you, you can drop the facade you don't have to have all of the like uh not not necessarily like masks but like all the things that we put on to like seem tough or strong or to feel like we have to fit in like you can let that go hey no one's out here no one's looking at you just like what do you want to say to this garden right it's just you in the garden do what you want to do yeah no that makes a lot of sense um because it, it's almost like you know if the sun is out it's like looking at you it's got its eye on you whereas if the moon's out you're like oh hey moon we're just two friends out here. <laughs> All right. I, I don't know if I agree with that, but you know. Okay. Yeah, you know, as I was saying it, I was like, I don't know, the moon might also be looking at you. <laughs> but sometimes the moon is hiding because it's shy. That's true. The sun uh, is never hiding. Or, or, it, or the earth moves. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, look, eh, we can't know. I think it's because it's shy. <laughs> I haven't read, I didn't take any science in high school, so I don't. Yeah. Know. Who knows? It's not required anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the title promises a history of gardening, and it provides a local history in lieu of mm -hmm. a cultural one. Yeah. Uh, and realistically, it's multiple histories through a single loci. Uh, how is history able to contain so little and so much at the same time? Uh, and also, we kind of talked about this, but why is it important to keep poetic history present? Yeah, gosh, okay. Because um, I feel like this could be like the I could do an hour on history, probably yes. if I if I wanted to. I always but save I my really like uh, existential question for the last question yes. because I like that it can go anywhere. Yeah, well, like uh, I think you probably know this because you were reading a lot of these poems, but I had like an entire manuscript of history poems at a certain yeah. point. And Gatherer has some of them in there, but a lot of them went away because they it wasn't really uh, serving what, what the book was going to become. But I became super interested in this idea of calling something a history and then having it be like a very localized, like, as you said, like something just about like me and my family or where I grew up or like the very specific time period that I'm that I was familiar with. Right. Like 1990s, early 2000s, you know, suburbs of Nashville, that that kind of history. Um, and so. I mean, I think the thing that I always say is like, isn't history just the stories we we say? And then eventually, like, someone codifies them, someone writes them down, and it becomes, like, a historical record. And so what if, like, we had a history that wasn't so interested in the big picture things that happened, but actually took very seriously, like, oh, hey, uh, you know, this person had a, had a rose bush garden, and isn't that nice? And this person grew zucchini. Oh, that's fun. And, like, to take history and really bring it down to a more human level because i think like history becomes this like all-encompassing thing or we think like oh we gotta know history or else you know, you're doomed to repeat it and like the truth is whether you know history or not we're probably gonna be doomed to repeat stuff that would like I, I don't think that's the idea that like you can learn your way out of making a mistake is i think um a nice idea but not borne out by the facts <laughs> because how many how many times can you like you know sit in a classroom or sit in like a you know a high school auditorium and have someone be like kids don't do this don't do that <laughs> and like they're gonna do it yeah <clears throat> it's like a, the rare person that's not gonna be like well i gotta try it 
<laughs> well, it's a challenge. Honestly, that, yeah. that is a direct challenge. Much yes. A form asks you to challenge yourself to complete the form. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And so, like, yeah, I think history can hold in a lot, right? Just in the way that, like, um, like poetry can hold a lot. I think history asks a lot of us. And so, you know, I think for me, it was like, uh, honestly, for me, I think it was kind of a joke. I was like, what if I call all of these things a history of something? And then, you know, I think that A does get lets you get away with a lot, right? If mm -hmm. I called it the history of gardening, then it would have to be an expansive, like all encompassing, here's who the first gardeners were, you know, blah, 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 blah. But because I use the A in my mind, I can get away with sort of cheating the rules and just being like, here's a little story. Here's just a little thing I wanted to say. Yeah. Totally agree. Uh yeah. So poetic history, why yeah. is it important to keep poetic history present? Man, can't the answer just be like a lot of it's pretty good? <laughs> I don't, maybe that's dumb. I, I recognize a lot of people do not care about any poetry that was written before their lifetime. And I totally get that because especially like if you're like a, a marginalized group or something, or you're somebody who doesn't, who like comes from a different like poetic tradition, then yeah, I don't think you have to sit there and be like, mm, T.S. Eliot, good stuff. But like as the, you know, sort of like indoor kid who really resonated weirdly with John Keats at a young age or T.S. Eliot or any of these guys, like for me, the reason why I kept it alive is because I really liked it. I just thought like, oh, wow, this is so cool. Uh, you know, like this, this guy's writing a poem about how he thinks he might die young and he did. That's crazy, right? Like, there's all these sort of interesting stories. And of course, if you dig into the, the like biography or history of any of these these poets, it just gets even more uh, sort of wild the, the more you go. Every time I like mention Lord Byron to my students, I have to just go on a tangent. I'm like, and look, maybe he had a kid with his sister. We can't talk about it. We don't have time. <laughs> and they're like, wait, what? And I'm like, no, don't worry about it. It's fine. He was drummed out of London for for sleeping around too much and they're like what fine it's fine so like that's part of it i think like there there are so many poets that we think of as like historical or canonical poets that i think are just good i don't know and i and i think like once again if it's not your bag don't force yourself don't read stuff just because you've been told it was good if you don't like it but i think the other thing is uh you know, and I know I just said, like, if you know your history, you're still going to repeat it. Yeah. But I think, like, it doesn't hurt to know who people are talking about when they talk about them, right? Like, if you're, um, you don't, it sort of is like if you walk into a party and you're like, oh, I just saw a really cool movie. And you're talking about, like, a remake of, like, if you were like, I just saw the new Evil Dead movie. And someone was like, yeah, did you like the original? And you're like, there's an original? Yeah. Then you look kind of foolish. Um, now, hopefully, and well, not even hopefully. We know poets would would slap you if you came in and were like, "You don't know who's, you know, pick your your poet. You don't know Wallace Stevens. No, I don't know Wallace Stevens, and I don't feel bad about. It. Like, I shouldn't have to feel bad for not knowing, you know, about <laughs> William Carlos Williams' Ice Box of Plums. I didn't know about it. I just thought it was a funny poem, and so I did my own version of it. Um, so like, there's something to be said about knowing your history so that you can better respond to it. But I also think like, there's a reason why people are, are more skeptical of the canon now, because like, we don't have to just have the same group of people be the only ones that are, that are being canonized. Like there's so many poets throughout history, like not even that far removed history, who uh, were doing a lot of interesting, great work that could still speak to a contemporary audience that we just don't know about because, you know, the mechanisms of, you know, capitalism or power structures at play, whatever you want to call it, just didn't allow them to get their voice out there or at least didn't allow them to get their voice out to like a wide, wide, wide audience. Right. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's like the publish industry now, you know, like, it's it's small like yeah yeah it's pretty small 
Yeah, uh-huh. it feels yeah. expansive some days, but it if you like step back, you're like, oh wait, it's it's not really. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's hard to it's hard to know because we don't know. I mean, mm-hmm. that, that's kind of what it comes down to in the in yeah. the end. Because every once in a while, like I'll go to a used bookstore and like just pick something up and be like what is this this is interesting stuff and i've never heard of the person and it's like uh why not why no one read this like no one that was in a position of power read this whatsoever you know and and maybe yeah Um, but it could also have been you know they didn't want to project that particular style or person or whatever Mm mm-hmm well, and like how many times is someone like seen as uh, like a failure in their lifetime and then are discovered later, right? Like, would we have like Emily Dickinson or Herman Melville if someone hadn't gone back and been like, oh, this is actually really interesting and people just didn't get it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, I was going to say, one day that'll be Matthew Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I was thinking earlier? Uh, this is way off topic, but not really, is we took that, uh, the form, a forms class together and yeah. I wrote a sonnet where the, uh, last word was the same word for all six words. And, <laughs> and so it's just basically one end word for each line, yeah. same end word. Yeah. And, you know, the, the question I still have for myself is, is like, did it work in any way you know right and i still don't know i yeah some days it's yes and some days it's mm-hmm. no because yeah. you know how am i to, how am i to answer that for myself really mm-hmm. uh, but but it goes back to what you were talking about like deadening a word uh yeah because it completely deadens the word and so if, if it's dead within the first stanza yeah like what happens through the rest of the poem and that also makes me think of like trying to write a sonnet crown Mm -hmm. a sonnet crown where you have to like kind of redo the same thing differently each time and i thought the trouble with that was somewhere in the middle it becomes very difficult yeah yeah (laughs) like like the end not so bad but somewhere in the middle I'm like, I've kind of run the whole course of like what I can do with this information, Mm -hmm. this topic, whatever. Yeah. And I think that's what becomes really hard about an extended poem within a specific form. Yeah. And maybe that's what I was searching for in in, Mm -hmm. in a Sestina with the same end word. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I have any answers for those questions, Uh, but I like like searching, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think like it's one of the reasons why the Pachakcha as a form, and I guess for those that don't know, it's like a very interesting form pioneered by Terence Hayes, where you have 20 stanzas that are roughly four to five lines each. And each stanza has as its like header some something else. Like could be a work of art or it could just be a phrase or whatever. The thing that I sort of discovered in like really picking apart the the uh, Pachakcha is that you can't stay on the same topic. Like Terrence Hayes in writing Pachakcha for the most part sort of jumps around to a couple of different things. And the like two that I've written that are success that I think were successes, uh, I basically had to be like, okay, there's one thread that I'm going to follow every, you know, four or five stanzas and another thread and another thread. Um, because if you try to stay on that same topic for 20 stanzas, And like 20 standards isn't the most, but you end up with like somewhere between 80 and 100 lines. Right. And that's hard to do. And then you look at like a sonnet crown where you're going to end up with like 196 lines. And and at least, uh, I don't know the math, like 27 of them are going to be repeated. Or I guess 14 of them will then become the last 14. Right. It's like the math of that is so hard to do really well that when you see it done well, you just go, oh, yeah, well, that's that's what it should be but I don't know how to do that. Yeah, well, it's 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 somehow, like how do you look forward enough to make sure that those last, the, the 14 lines are gonna do the job in the last crown? Yeah. 
Like it seems really, really impossible to do, even yeah. even taking into account revision. Yeah. Like because once you revise, you still have to make everything situate in some manner yeah. to make a regular sonnet for one of the crown portions. Yeah. Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Like you have to have like every individual sonnet needs to work on its own and needs to look forward to the one at the end. Yeah. Which is yeah, really tough. Well, Todd, we will end on poetry is tough. Hey, I think that's honestly no one said that before. Poetry, <laughs> pretty tough. <laughs> well, thank you for joining me today. Uh yes. Again, thank you so yeah, much for having me. Out on Bell Point. Yeah. Uh, go take a look at that. And uh I appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks.